This is Pete Feenster on Wednesday, the 3rd of October 2002, live at the BBC with Giant Shaw Taylor. Great to have you here, Giant. Thank you very much. Talking about your brand new album, which Tom Twistingly is called Almost Always Never. It is indeed. Which kind of reflects quite a few of the lyrics on there, which are kind of not contradictory, but very, very clever. Do you think a lot about them, a lot about the writing that went into this album? Um, yeah, I mean, um, I had a little bit more time with this album than we did with the previous two. I think yeah. about a month in total right. to write it, which was a luxury. So, um, As opposed to writing in the back of a van? Yeah, on, on an aeroplane, we've done that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, um, we had about a month in total when I, I got a lot more material. Yeah. So um, I just wrote everything and anything, really, and um, yeah. handed them on to the producer. Like, really. Are these uh, songs autobiographical or are they kind of universal themes that people um, would recognise? Yeah, I mean, I would say they're autobiographical. They're not all about me, but certainly, you know, friends. Situations. Yeah, and, you know, look, I find it easier to write about things that I have some sort of knowledge about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, that um, comes through in the songs. Oh, it really does. And your singing, your phrasing has, has gone up a notch. Have you worked on that? Um, Kind of. I mean, it's um, it's. I haven't been having any vocal lessons, but I think the sort of touring and over the past three years has helped a great deal. Yeah, I'm sure it has. And, and and the way you actually deliver your lines on this album, uh, some of them sound really in the moment, live in the studio. Was that how it was done? Yeah, I mean, um, you've even altered the lyrics on a couple of. Yeah. Song, I think, you know. Yeah, we actually wrote the lyrics as we were sort of singing it. <laughs> um, right. Yeah, I mean, a lot of it was, you know, you have to try and keep some of those elements in. Yeah. So this is a, a really adventurous and exciting album which strikes off in a completely different direction from what you've done before. Was that the intention? Because you know, you, you've actually changed as you've as you recorded. Yeah. Um, I mean, it wasn't the intention to, to divert from what I was doing, it was just the intention to try and write as good a songs as I possibly could. Um, you know, which I'm still learning how to do that really, but yeah. that's what I tried to do, and, and those were my first, the best ones. I and of course your last two albums you had a working relationship with producer Jim Gaines. This one's been uh, produced and overseen by Mike McCarthy, the famous guy in Austin there who I did something with Spoon a few years ago. Yeah. Uh, how did you end up working with him? Um, actually my manager's friends with his manager and I guess they got talking about me one evening and um, I just relocated to Houston. We've been spending a lot of time in Houston, and um, Mike's obviously over in Austin about an hour or so away. So um, we kind of got, they got us together for a meeting. I went over to the studio and met him, and, and we clicked. And it seemed um, I was kind of ready for a change, you know, and try something different, push me out my comfort zone. So was it noticeably different work with him than it was? You were used to before? Yeah, I mean, firstly, he comes from a totally different background. Yeah, you know, and, he, and he, Yeah, and he didn't really know of me, so there was sort of, there was no sort of preconceptions about what I should do, just try and make, you know. He was just very focused on what I was doing in that moment and not my back catalogue, so that was good. Yeah, yeah. And as you say, you had a good, you, you things click with him. I mean, uh, did he have to push you to, to go into this new direction at all? I mean, how much, how much of it? Well, this album is, is you and how, many, how how were the songs done before you went in there, for example? Had you written um, them or were they just parts and then he You know, it's them? funny on some of them, like, um, <clears throat> Standing to Fall was almost like a death metal song. It was yeah, like really... He's got some big riffs on there, yeah. <laughs> that, you know, and he kind of made it more into a prog rock song, so... You know, the word differences, um, almost always never, was also a little bit heavier. I kind of envisioned it as sort of a, like a softer thing, that right. kind of song. Um, idea, yeah. But you know, so things did get changed around, and the songs were different to anything I'd done before, and also they were very different from each other. So that was the main worry of making, you know, it sound. Uh, and so, what would be your your um, touchstone for, for your singing to sound? Would it be your guitar playing, or would it be the lyrics that, that would give coherence to the whole um, this new direction? I kind of like to think it's the package. I.e., it's the fact that you know, I kind of play guitar a bit and the voice and. It's a lot of original material, and it's you know I think there's some common threads in that package between this album and what you you know whether or not they're that obvious. Or not. Did the songs change from when you took them to the studio? I mean, there's a couple of songs there that have got real jammed out finishes on them. Yeah. Big, big solos. Yeah, like you said, I mean, standing to fall was quite an up tempo. You know. Piece of the sky. That's a yeah, that real was, Texas piece, isn't it? Yeah, that was kind of one that didn't kind of change. Actually, I've had that song for a long while. Um, Army of One was a lot heavier, and you know, it got stripped down. Oh, Army of One is such an interesting. It's 
completely uh, radically <laughs> different from what you've ever done before. Well, where did that come from? It, actually, I wrote it as kind of a. It was sounded a bit more in like the going home oh. vibe or dead and gone off the, the previous oh, two albums, right, right, right. and then Mike's oh. idea to make it more Zeppelin. Zeppelin, yeah, yeah. Do the kind of that. acoustic thing, but um, yeah, that was a fun song to record. I did that last. Year. And you opened with Soul Station, one of the, one of the very best songs on the album, which is all very notable for the fact it's layered sound and. Mm -hmm. Guitar and synth and everything else that goes in there. Was that written as the lead song on the record? Um, no, it wasn't sort of written that way. But certainly when we recorded it, it became obvious that you know the best place to put it was the, the opening track. As you said. Oh, it's it's a real arresting track. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of um, it's a good introduction to the album, I think. So, of all the songs on here, were, were they all written yes. at the same time? Um, predominantly, yeah, pretty much. Um, the exception being Piece of the Sky, which I wrote when I was 18. Did you really? That yeah. sounds a little bit like story, but that's why it's funny. Oh, yeah. Texas, you know, it's got yeah. a big feel in it. It builds the Alfred big... Milligan kind of yeah, 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 very much so. Yeah. Some of the other songs, Beautifully Broken, that almost sounds a bit like Dylan. Oh, nice. Yeah, that's Lyrically, that's, um... the way it's put together. Was that, was that written with a radio, radio play in mind, maybe, or...? Um, I mean that actually was, as you mentioned earlier, one of the ones that got changed a lot. That was another kind of a tempo, sounding more like a Richard Cotton song, and then it might kind of changed into just slowed it down a great deal, and it sounded like a stone kind of vibe to me. And, uh, kind of was a bit more. Yeah. and uh, whose idea was it to source the uh, Frankie Miller song "Jealousy"? Unfortunately, that credit, and I'm gonna have to live with this the rest of my life, goes to my boyfriend. All right, well, and uh, I'm never going to live that down, because so, right, everybody seems to love that song. So. Well, it, the funny thing is, that it's the only cover and it fits in really well with the flow and the sequencing of the album. Yeah, I mean, I was surprised, and I don't know if you and heard the original. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the yeah, original's got like the twin guitar things on, like, well, the thing years kind of years. Yeah. But um, we ended up not doing that, but um, I thought it worked out really well. That's one of my favourites, you know. And you've got a kind of distorted guitar tone on that. Was that, was that to give it a bit of edge? Yeah, that was, um, I mean, Mike's kind of really into, you know, the whole Jimmy Page kind of era. Oh, so we have the old Marshall and Echo Flex kind of, kind of going, made it a bit eerie. And standing to fall again builds to a great big end. Was that how it was conceived before you recorded it? No, I mean, that was... Um, no, I mean, again, that was meant to be more of like an up-tempo rock song, but it just kind of turned into this classic rock kind of rock. And the final track, you have to tell me what the title is, I've forgotten, but it's a Lose Myself to Love You. Really good, really good ballad. Yeah. Again, um, different from what's on the album elsewhere. Yeah, it, it is very different. Um, a good story, I think, or I hope so. I was quite pleased with how that turned out. Yeah. Luke, um, you know, they're all very different songs, but it, I hope it does tie together very well, I think. Yeah. I think it's an interesting album. Well, it absolutely is, and, and, and thinking about that, uh, thinking about the fact that there's a lot of layered sounds and tone colours and all this kind of business, how are you going to transpose what's on this album to the live sort of setting? Do you have to make any adjustments for uh, Yeah, we've added a keyboard player for this tour, so we're moving away from the three-piece uh, vibe, which I think the most interesting thing there is not how we make these songs live, but something on them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's kind yeah. of the, the fun challenge there. So what's the band going to be on this tour? Um, this is my usual US touring band, which is uh, Tony DiCello, uh, who joined us in April, and Joseph Malone on the bass, who joined us uh, at the beginning of the year, and then we have a British keyboard player called Jules Grunge. Oh, he's excellent. Yeah, that's yeah. So, just going back to talking and telling this with Mike, the producer, he's a, he's a guy who apparently goes to, works on one song at a time gets into the vibe of a song rather than doing a countless number of drum parts and you know yeah doing it that way did, did that mean that he brought more or he got more out of a song that he could actually take yeah and well, i think that's was kind of a happy accident working with like that we were both very soul oriented you know yeah. um because at the end of the day a guitar solo is a good guitar solo is a good guitar solo but if it's not on a good song yeah you know, Again. Well, the so strong thing about this album is that you've got some blistering solos on there, but they don't actually arrive where you think they're going to arrive. <laughs> some of these songs really build up attention, rack up attention, and then you let them out. Yeah. Whereas you know, previously you'd play a shuffle or a very interesting song and it'd, it'd be guitar-led. A lot of these songs are actually keyboard-led, aren't they? Yeah, and that was the nice thing about that as well. It's like when the guitar is in there, it's in there for a reason and it has a purpose. Whereas like Lose Myself to Loving You, if a song didn't need a guitar solo, we didn't put one on there. Yeah. yeah. 
uh, which I think that is actually the only song with that one, but um, you know, it was nice to structure the, the guitar solos a bit more and not have the sort of an advertising guitar solo. No, no, it's quite the opposite. It's quite eclectic at parts, some really catchy at other parts, some good melodies, some, some really nice layered sounds. Is this going to be a, a template for your next album as well? I mean, I'm sure you're not even thinking about that yet, but I mean... Like, uh, I don't know. I mean, I always like to try and do different albums. Yeah. Um, but as long as what I want to be able to do is go back and say ten albums, and yeah. well, they they all sound like Joanne Taylor. Whole so. catalogue of songs. Yeah. And finally, we should let everybody out there know about your tour, which I think starts in your hometown of Birmingham on yeah, October the ninth. Yeah, Bilston, the Rock Two, October the ninth. We've got them uh, here now. Then Bristol tunnels. Bristol tunnels on the eleventh. Tavistock the Wharf uh, on the 12th, um, from the 13th, Ball on the 14th, with Mr. Kipps, uh, Arrow at London, Hotel, Leicester Square Theatre on the 16th. Yeah, that's a new one, that's, that should be interesting. Yeah, the yeah. Haunts, Brighton on the 19th, Arts Centre Norwich on the 20th, Waterside Sale 21st, Duchess York 23rd, Newcastle on the 24th, Glasgow O'Sville on the 26th. We're making it work. Yeah. Stockton Arc, I sound like a web presenter. Stockton Arc on the 27th and finishing at Boston Wrestling Rooms on the 28th. So that pretty well covers the whole of the UK. Go out and see it. Once again, the new album is titled Almost Always Never. As I said, a real Tom Twister. Really great album. It's been Pete Feast to talk to Joanne Shorte for GetReadyToRock.com. Thank you to Eric Harvey on the camera and good afternoon. Thank you.